Hello, this is Emmanuel Bardin from Necker Hospital in Paris, and I'm working mainly on cystic fibrosis. So there is this novel triple combination of CFTO modulators uh, called ETI, which has transformed the life of many people with CF in the couple of last years. It has also transformed the way we treat and care for them. So in the clinic, the effects of this new therapy are monitored notably through lung function measurements, chloride concentration in sweat, as well as microbiological assays from respiratory samples such as sputum that the patients expectorate. And hopefully now people with CF will be maintaining an, a higher lung function and expectorate less sputum, which means that we need to develop new approaches to evaluate the patient's health status and treatment's efficacy. So a previous study by Nierings and colleagues in the Netherlands showed that CFTO modulators such as ETI modified the sputum metabolome and also the composition of breath. So we made the hypothesis that breath reflects what's happening in the body and in the lungs. And we looked into whether breath may serve as a non-invasive tool to, to evaluate the impact of ETI on the very short term, as soon as within the first week of treatment. Our pilot cohort included 11 children starting the treatment who had an overall mild lung disease. We asked them to visit the clinic before starting the treatment in the course of the first week and after one month of treatment. They had the classical clinical functional and microbiological tests plus breath analysis. Breast samples were collected on sorbent tubes using the receiver device and analyzed by thermodesorption and two-dimensional GCMS. As we expected, most patients were quickly responsive to ETI, as shown, as shown by an important decrease in sweat chloride. Yet the improvement is not that clear on lung function since these children had uh, an already high basal lung function, which is usually, usually the case in children. Um, 2D GCMS detected thousands of spectral features, so we used multivariate analysis to compare breath profiles at each visit. And here um, on figure A, the supervised PLSDA um, shows that the breath samples uh, separate between visits. They progressively shifted from day 0 to day 30. And using a longitudinal model, we could identify 12 individual volatile metabolites, or in short, VOX. And these were significantly modified during the treatment. You can see, as an example, an, the evolution of two of them in figure B. And next to it, uh, the clustering analysis uh, was built using these 12 VOX and nicely classifies the samples into three arms corresponding to the day of visit. So in summary, breath analysis was quick, non-invasive, and well-received by children and families. Breath changed progressively from the first days of treatment, suggesting early metabolic, physiological, or physical modifications in the lungs, or even more likely a combination of these. The metabolic origin of the impacted box is currently being investigated, and we hope to unveil mechanisms of action of this treatment that are still not fully understood. In the future, uh, this box might serve as a non-invasive tool for clinical and therapeutic mon monitoring in patients with uh, normal lung function, such as children. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a nice conference. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're enjoying Breath Biopsy 2023. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk about our work on hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is the gas that gives eggs the eggy smell. Um, so it's quite unpleasant. Uh, and it's also present in other foods such as brassicas and cabbage. Now at very low levels, hydrogen sulfide performs many healthy functions, but it only takes a slight rise in these levels in, within the gut uh, for it to start to cause problems. So those problems could be pro-inflammatory conditions, and it can also contribute to increases in motility and diarrhea. 
but it is quite an elusive gas. And therefore it's been very tricky to record hydrogen sulfide and try and establish what the normal values are and then roll that out into a test that's reliable to look at patients. Now this has been a five or six year odyssey for us. I think the main problem that we've had is being able to find a stable way of collecting hydrogen sulfide, uh, making sure that those collection vials are able to keep the hydrogen sulfide stable and then obviously having a machine that is sensitive enough to measure very low levels of hydrogen sulfide. We first attempted this with test tubes um, uh, several years ago with normal gas chromatography. And no matter what we did, the samples would just disappear. Uh, the hydrogen sulfide levels would disappear very quickly. So we kind of gave up. But after breath biopsy 21, um, we got in touch with, uh, we, we started a collaboration with Alstone and Anatune and used a new technology, SIFT MS. Um, and as all good scientists do, um, in order to see whether this was feasible to record hydrogen sulfide, I got up early one morning, had a curry, then went in at lunchtime and to see whether the fermentation within my gut could produce hydrogen sulfide on my breath. We also had a calibration cylinder, which had um, hydrogen sulfide, methane, and other control gases within it, so we could do some calibration tests. And lo and behold, we could actually pick up hydrogen sulfide, but this was at levels of 10 part per million within the um, gas canister. Uh, and what we saw from my own breath was that the hydrogen sulfide levels were there, but much, much lower in the parts per billion range. So we then began to address the issue of collection and all of the Tedlar bags and uh, test tubes that we used were not really suitable. Um, so we attempted to use PVDF bags um, and lo and behold with this collection device, the samples seemed to remain stable. And the guys at Alstone were able to do some stability work, both um, with test gases, but also mixed with breath and moisture. And they showed that the PVDF bags kept the hydrogen sulfide uh, samples stable for up to nine days. So therefore, we were quite confident that we had uh, a technique that we could use in a clinical study. So as part of a bigger clinical study, uh, we studied 25 healthy volunteers and we took samples at baseline after a 24 hour white diet and an overnight fast. And this established what the baseline hydrogen sulfide levels were. And then they ingested 10 mils of lactulose, which we know activates the microbiome. Uh, and the activation of the microbiome goes up over time, peaking at about 180 minutes. So after that, we took breath samples at 45 minutes, 90 minutes and 180 minutes. And the samples were then shipped over to the Alstone lab to be analyzed on the SIF MS. And what we saw was that between the two visits that people came 28 days apart, the values were remarkably similar. And that allowed us to have some confidence that the normal range for hydrogen sulfide in healthy subjects was around 20 parts per billion. And what we also saw in healthy subjects was that we didn't really see a response to lactulose. What this probably means is that these kinds of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria are at very low levels um, within the healthy microbiome. And they will get outcompeted for the hydrogen they need by other existing organisms. We knew that fermentation was occurring, as you can see the graph in figure three, because hydrogen levels were rising consistently over time. So the microbiome was active, but it just wasn't producing much hydrogen sulfide. Now we've been able to start looking at this in patients now with a degree of certainty. And what we've seen is that patients who often have reported a flat line response to hydrogen and methane, uh, meaning that the hydrogen sulfide organisms are out competing them for, for those gases, um, that we can get values well above 100 parts per billion. And this seems to increase as you get towards proximal colon, as you would expect. So what we're doing now is we are rolling this out into the patient population and looking at interesting cases. Uh, there are very limited treatments at the moment for hydrogen sulfide, but you can think, use things like peptobismol um, and you can use antibiotics. But we hope to be able to uh, look at dietary interventions like a low um, sulfur diet and look at the effects of these going forward.
Uh, we also want to look at different populations, not just an IBS diarrhea population, but also move into conditions such as um, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so it was a long time in the making, but we're now confident we have a, a super accurate and stable test that can be rolled out clinically. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Daniela Polak from the University of Heidelberg in Germany, and here I will present our newest results in breath methane monitoring. Methane, the simplest carbon-based volatile organic compound, which can be detected in human breath, has long been exclusively associated with anaerobic microbial activity in the gastrointestinal tract. Numerous studies have investigated methane in exhaled breath and tried to link increased methane production to specific diseases. Most of these studies only differentiate between breath methane producers and breath methane non-producers. However, recently we found that the probability of increased breath methane increases through age and also that person-specific breath methane levels can vary drastically over short intervals. That means high emitters become low emitters and vice versa. In terms of the mechanisms of methane formation, it has recently been found that methane might also be produced endogenously in cells through oxidative reductive stress reactions. Here we see the results from the long-term monitoring of two subjects, one female and one male. The table gives an overview of the immune and inflammation events of subject A and B during the monitoring period, represented by the vertical gray shaded columns in the plot. Different colors in the plot indicate different percentiles of breath methane values related to the periods of immune events. Red color indicates the activated immune level, yellow the medium immune level, and green the normal level. Both subjects monitored exhibited significant, de significant deviations from their normal methane breath levels during periods of potential enhanced immune activity. During periods of immune events, breath methane values of such a B generally showed an increase by a factor of up to 25 compared to normal level. In contrast, breath methane values of subject A showed a general drop during immune events with a factor of up to 3 compared to normal level. The zoomed areas show exemplarily the effects from the first COVID-19 vaccinations on endogenous breath methane values. In the first 30 to 50 hours after the third COVID-19 vaccination, breath values of subject A were additionally analyzed for the isotope decomposition of methane. Application of stable isotopes is a well-established tool for investigating pathways of methane formation and degradation. The observed increase in stable carbon and hydrogen isotopes within the first 15 hours after vaccination in combination with reduced methane production rather supports the hypothesis of methane degradation. To the best of our knowledge, methane degradation in the human body has not been reported before. Therefore, hypotheses on potential chemical or microbial degradation pathways are lacking. So summarizing the results of methane breath monitoring of two years in two contrasting subjects, we observed that an activated immune level was almost always indicated by exceeding individual breath methane limits. The observed individual breath methane dynamics supports the hypothesis that methane has a potential bioactive role in immunology and might serve as a marker of oxidoreductive stress. Potential mechanisms of methane production and degradation might include microbial and or non-microbial pathways, which are illustrated in the scheme. We are aware that methane breath measurements of only two subjects are too low to draw broad and general conclusions. However, our study represents a proof of principle that human breath methane dynamics is an indicator of increased oxidative stress during immune and inflammatory processes. Also, the study cannot clarify whether the observed methane dynamics following immune reactions are solely driven by the generation of ROS or controlled by microbes or a combination of both, it highlights methane as an in vivo parameter that might, for example, provide substantial benefits in classifying the efficiency of treatments such as vaccination or during the application of personalized medicine. Therefore, in further studies, additional immune parameters such as antibody level can be recorded to calibrate breath methane values according to the quality and extent of the immune response. Future studies should focus on deciphering the potential physiological role and predictive regulation mechanisms of methane in humans. 
frequent monitoring of methane as an oxidative stress biomarker and indicator of individual immune states should be studied in combination with additional immune parameters. However, further investigations are required to obtain clear evidence of potential dysbiosis or non-microbial methane, methane production in humans and the underlying processes of its formation and degradation. So, thank you for your interest in this poster and if you have further questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact me. Hello, I'm Alexandra Martin, a senior scientist in the Analytical Science Research and Development team at Alstom, and today I'll be presenting our poster on using exogenous volatile organic compound or EVOC probes to target tumor-associated aldoketose reductase enzyme activity as a potential tool to detect lung cancer on breath. Our aim is to investigate aldoketoreductase or AKR activity in lung cancer cells as a first step towards developing an EVOC probe based test for lung cancer screening and early detection. This is achieved through firstly evaluating the expression of different AKR enzymes associated with aldehyde metabolization in lung cancer and non neoplastic cancer tissue samples, then detecting AKR associated alcohols and aldehydes from in vitro headspace using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry or GCMS workflow. The same approach for our clinical breath biopsy samples. And finally, assessing the impact of AKR inhibition on VOC levels in these headspace samples. I'll first take a step back to discuss why we're looking at AKRs for cancer detection on breath. Cancer metabolization is a promising but mostly untapped area for diagnostic tests. And while cancer genomics vary greatly, the changes that occur converge onto key metabolic pathways to result in changes to ensure the survival of cancer cells in the harsh tumor microenvironment. We see that the use of agents such as UDP glucose or PET scans can show how we can target these metabolic pathways with exogenous compounds we expose the subject to, resulting in high sensitivity for cancer detection. We hypothesize that a comparable approach can be applied in use with non-invasive breath sampling to give us a reliable early detection of cancer. This method would be well suited to a cancer screening program that would sit in community health centers or even at the point of care, which could catch more cancer cases earlier and dramatically improve cancer survival. And lung cancer is an area where there is significant unmet need to do so and improve early detection through screening of higher risk populations. Occurrence and mortality in these cases are high, and most are diagnosed in later stages, where prognosis is much poorer. Furthermore, the physiological location of lung cancers makes it particularly well suited to detect with breath sampling. So we have chosen this as our initial focus of work. The fast growth and low blood flow and persistent genetic errors in cancer cells lead to high levels of oxidative stress, which is characterized by an increase in reactive oxygen species, or ROS. Then, these ROS promotes destructive processes like lipid peroxidation, which then produces excess aldehydes. To help process these aldehydes and convert them into compounds easier to clear from the body, human lung cancers lead to an increase in aldoketoreductase or AKR enzymes to reduce these aldehydes into alcohols. Therefore, we are seeking to investigate if these AKRs can be targeted with an exogenous organic compound or EVOC probe and monitor metabolization of the compound on breath using the breath biopsy platform. So in this figure, we're looking at the summary of our EVOC probe approach. An administered probe is introduced, perhaps via IV injection or ingestion, but our ideal approach might be by inhaling an aerosolized formula of the probe. We then monitor the probe and metabolic bioproducts with non-invasive breath sampling. In this case, the EVOC probe is targeting AKR enzymes, which are upregulated in lung cancer cases, so high production of the alcohol bioproducts would be indicative of lung cancer. We used biological and chemical in vitro methods to investigate the effect of AKR activity modulation on the recovery of volatile compounds from sample headspace. A549 and H460 lung cancer cells were cultured for chemical inhibition tests and seeded into 24 well plates. The inhibitor Tolrostat was applied at IC50 and IC75 based on the AKR activity assay, and another inhibitor, JF0064, was applied at 10 micromolar. We expected higher inhibitory effect of Tolrostat on AKR1B15, but smaller effects for AKR1B10 and AKR1B1 but JF0064 to inhibit AKR1B10 more than AKR1B15. 
both inhibitors were applied for 24 hours. And then cells with or without different inhibitors were then treated with AKR targeting volatile substrates. Different aldehydes, which we will refer to as alkanal 1 and 2, alkenal 1 and 2, and aromatic aldehyde 1. After addition of the volatile aldehyde substrates, samples of the cell culture media were collected from well plates over three time points and kept at minus 80 degrees prior to the headspace VOC analysis. In a similar fashion, knockout clones for A549 cells were developed for biological abrogation of AKR activity. Three clones of AKR1B10 knockouts and three clones of AKR1B15 knockouts were developed with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and a mock Cas9 was used as a control or a wild type. Again, these cells were treated with the aldehyde substrates and cell culture media samples were collected over time for VOC analysis. Additional plates were run to control for evaporation and cross-contamination, where aldehydes were added to media-only wells with no cells present, and blanks were also run where the treatment vehicle DMSO was administered only to cells. The VOCs in the cell culture media samples were analysed using headspace gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, or headspace GCMS. A small sample volume of 50 microliters was allocated into a 10 mil headspace farm and gently heated to generate a VOC rich environment in the sealed headspace above the liquid sample. PDMS headspace sampling high sorb probes were then inserted into the vials and the samples incubated further to allow the high sorb probes to capture the VOCs. The high sorb probes were then transformed, transferred to our thermal desorption system to transfer VOCs and then pre-concentrate the sample prior to separation by gas chromatography and detection and identification with either time of flight mass spectrometry or orbitrap mass spectrometry. In addition to AKR activity and VOC assays, the TCGA database was also exploited to investigate the expression of different AKR enzymes in tissue samples from lung cancer patients. The plot at the top shows AKR1B15 and 1B10 and 1B1 expression in cancer and non-neoplastic samples or the cancer-free tissue. We see that most cancer samples can be discriminated from non-neoplastic samples based on the gene expression of these AKRs. Furthermore, we also looked at representative immunostaining of lung cancer specimens showing expression of AKR1B1 and or AKR1B10 higher in cancer cells compared with the surrounding non-neoplastic lung cells. These results give good indication that targeting AK activity with compounds detectable on breath can be used to detect lung cancer. Before we could run the samples with Headspace GCMS, we established our sensitivity capabilities in these small volumes of media using chemical standards, including pairs of aldehyde substrate candidates and the expected alcohol bioproducts. The Headspace GCMS method was optimized such as incubation conditions, the desorption temperature and time, the GC ramp and target ions to achieve reliable and acceptable sensitivity capabilities for the VOC targets. Where the method could not be improved for a particular pair of compounds which had higher than ideal background levels, the concentration of aldehyde administered to the cells was then adjusted accordingly for alkanal 1. We then ran our cell culture media samples with the optimized headspace GCMS method. These plots show two pairs of administered aldehydes and the alcohol bioproducts added to A549 and H460 cell lines. In each plot, the dashed lines represent cell culture media without cells and the solid lines represent cell samples, demonstrating that VOC results for cell samples differ to our evaporation controls. The orange and dark blue traces on both plots show the administered aldehydes decreasing in concentration over time, more so in the cell lines than in the media-only samples, indicating that metabolization of the aldehydes is greater than the evaporation of the volatile compounds. In light blue and green, we see production of the bioproduct alcohols far higher in the cell lines, and in some cases, no detection at all of the alcohols in the background of the media-only controls. These results clearly demonstrate the production of alcohols by the lung cancer cells treated with aldehydes. We also used a commercial colorometric AKR activity assay validated for AKR1B10, AKR1C1 and AKR1C3 to evaluate the effect of Tolrostat and JF0064 as inhibitors in the two lung cancer cell lines. On the left, we see a dose-dependent effect of Tolrostat on the AKR activity of both lung cancer cell lines after 24 hours of treatment. However, on the right, we see JF0064 does not affect the overall activity after 24 hours. 
Having demonstrated the effect of the inhibitors on egg care activity with the commercial assay, we then looked to the VOC results for the cells treated with different inhibitors. These plots show the fold changes observed for A549 and H460 cells treated with inhibitors 30 minutes after the addition of two aldehydes and the subsequent two alcohols produced. In both cell lines, the top row demonstrates that the consumption of aldehyde by cells treated with different or no inhibitors has little difference, and the administered aldehydes alone are unlikely to be able to distinguish differences in AKR activity. However, the bottom row demonstrates much more clear distinction in the different inhibitor treatments. A dose-dependent response is observed between tolrostat and the inhib inhibition of alkanol and alkenol production in both A549 and H460 cells treated with the alkanal and alkenal. And we also see JF0064 inhibited the production of the alcohols compared with the vehicle-treated cells, indicating reduced air care activity, which wasn't actually detected as clearly with the commercial assay. In addition to the chemical inhibition of AKR activity, AKR1B10 and AKR1B15 knockouts were developed in A549 cells. Representative Sanger sequencing was used to confirm the presence of indels in the AKR1B10 and AKR1B15 knockouts. And Western blot analysis was used to show that two of the AKR1B15 knockouts also shows downregulation of the AKR1B10. We also used the commercial colometric AKR activity assay again to demonstrate reduction of AKR activity of over 50% in the AKR1B10 knockouts, but more varied levels were observed in the AKR1B15 knockouts. The VSC Headspace GCMS analysis again revealed that the consumption of aldehyde and production of alcohol bioproduct was higher in cell lines than the media only controls. Looking at the aldehyde levels over time for the wild type and knockout cells, we see a varied response, but the changes to alcohol byproduct levels were more distinct. The AKR1B15 knockouts demonstrated a reduced production of alcohols and the AKR1B10 knockouts showed even lower levels of alcohols. These results clearly demonstrate the relationship between VOC levels and AKR activity, and that GCMS detection of the alcohol targets could be used to identify higher levels of AKR activity indicative of lung cancer. So in conclusion, we have seen that AKR enzymes are potential targets for EVOC probes to detect lung cancer on breath. We've demonstrated the capacity to detect volatile compounds in the in vitro headspace. And using this in vitro headspace GCMS assay of human lung cancer cells, we've, we have shown the potential to monitor the metabolic conversion of aldehyde EVOC probes to bioproduct alcohols by AKR enzymes. Manipulation of AKR activity by inhibition and silencing demonstrates that the relationship is significant and sensitive to AKR changes. And finally, these preclinical samples were analysed using the same GCMS workflow to the approach for detection of VOCs in clinical breath samples with the breath biopsy platform. We are now looking to investigate the same relationships through in vivo and ex vivo samples to further establish the potential to use EVOC probes targeting AKR metabolism and de-risk other pathways as a tool for early detection of lung cancer.